Look at that. That was so cool. We are live and we are in. How you feel, Katie? You're muted. There we go. How are you feeling? I'm feeling really good, Ashley. I'm a little sad. My pen is not sticking on, but I'm feeling pretty <laughs> awesome. Thank you for asking. And we are live. We are live for another round of the Legal Lounge. And every time you see us, we don't get older. We just get better. <laughs> so if you're with us today, you're seeing some of our cool background. Shout out to the production crew. Xander, you are the bomb. We thank you. Anywho, so today we're back for another really cool conversation with some really awesome individuals. And we want to take some time today to start our day off right or start our night off right with some introductions from our special guests for today's conversation on the disproportionate impact of COVID-19. So who do we have here today? Um, I think our first question is going to be, who are you? <laughs> uh, what is your affiliation? And what is one superpower you would like to share with us? Now, before we bring you on, I got to say, I'm here with my favorite partner in crime and get trouble. <laughs> Katie Stanley here. Oh, oh and here comes Teresa. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't ready for that. <laughs> Look at that. And you're all here. This is very new stuff for us. All right. Well, <laughs> Teresa, Kenyatta, Angela, which of you would like to introduce yourselves first? Who are you? What's your affiliation? And what is one of your superpowers? Hmm. We're talking a real superpower or a superpower we wish we had? <laughs> oh, a real yeah, superpower. A but then when you said superpower, we wish we had. Oh, goodness. I don't want to limit you. Either one. <laughs> Either uh, one. I guess I'll and go first. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for having me on your show. I feel real fancy. Um, <laughs> uh, my name is Teresa Roach, and I am the Active Communities Director at the Crim Fitness Foundation. Uh, I also serve as the board chair for the Neighborhood Engagement Hub and serve on the Black Leadership Advisory Council for the state. Um, and so my superpower would be, hmm, oh man, I don't know. Uh, my superpower is getting all of the, um, I'm able to pet all the dogs when I see them. I'm, my <laughs> superpower is petting as many dogs as possible. That's a real superpower, especially that you have such a beautiful energy that you attract the dogs mm -hmm. and they allow you to pet them. Teresa just got a cute new puppy too. Just saying, if anybody <laughs> is having some puppy, puppy longing, Teresa's got a really cute one hanging out at home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you couldn't tell, we're dog people. <laughs> okay, <laughs> <laughs> who do we have next? I think Kenyatta is a little frozen. So how about you, Angelia? I knew you were going to call on me next. <laughs> Hi, Angela. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this invitation. And I am Angela Williams. I am Special Projects Director at Great Lakes Bay Health Centers in Saginaw. We serve over 56,000 um, people in the mid-region of uh, Michigan. And we are a federally qualified health center. My role, I am special, I'm director of special projects. And recently I have been the lead coordinator on our COVID community outreach for testing and now for COVID vaccines. And I'm excited to be here. And my superpower is tenacity. Mm. Mm. That's a good one. You would have to be, especially now, to do what you do. <laughs> Thank you. And Kenyatta, I feel like Kenyatta is frozen. So uh -oh. maybe we can circle back to Kenyatta when she comes back to us. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. That would be beautiful. Mm -hmm. 
Awesome. And so just as a, a brief soft intro, since we're going to go ahead and jump right in here, Kenyatta Dotson is a queen of many trades. See what I did there? Not Jack. She's a queen of many trades, right? <laughs> um, so she's been engaged with many organizations throughout the community. Um, you might know mm -hmm. her as one of the founders of Wild Outreach. Um, and she does a lot to crusade for families and against violence in Genesee County and surrounding areas. So mm -hmm. I'll offer that until she can come to us. All right. Kick us off, Katie. What are we starting with? Let's get right to it. You know, I think we're just going to jump right in. We, we want to focus this panel specifically on the impact in the community of COVID and then disproportionate impact. So our first question we were wanting to kind of get your guys' opinion and feelings about when we talk about COVID, so many of us often talk about it as a virus and how it affects the physical body, but not a lot of us are talking about how it affects communities. How do you guys see, and feel free to jump in, whoever wants to start, how do you see COVID impacting our community here? I can jump in. First of all, for the state, can you, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. We're getting some feedback, I think. Okay. First of all, um, African Americans comp are comprised of 13.7% of Michigan's population. And in April, 42.93% of COVID deaths uh, ac were accounted for for African Americans. And mm -hmm. so when we talk about the impact of COVID, we talk about the disparity, the health disparities, but we also talk about everything else that has quadrupled that already existed in terms of social determinants of health before COVID. Mm -hmm. And so now the limited access, food insecurities, the limited access to health care, lack of transportation, and then look at the school environment, look at what it what has impacted negatively to a degree with remote learning. And we have to think about the lack of technology and the lack of people's capability to use technology. And so I hope as a result of the lessons learned throughout COVID that we will be able to improve many of these aspects so that we're more prepared for the future or whatever we hope and pray we not have another pandemic like this. But at the same time, just taking into consideration and asking ourselves, what can we do to change this? What can we do to improve our own communities? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when I think about COVID and, and sort of uh, what has been the impact, and I might be I might be jumping us ahead to the super secret question that I already know. Um, <laughs> but what I think about a lot is how much how much isolation is being caused because of COVID. Um, a lot of people are, are able to do Zoom and FaceTime, which is wonderful and it's great. And I'm, you know, feel like we are really uh, fortunate that we've, a lot of us have figured out technology. But when I think about folks that haven't figured out technology, they're very isolated. Um, I'm very close with my, with my granny, with my grandma, who's my granny. And, you know, she doesn't really drive so much anymore. She doesn't understand Zoom. Mm. What she has is in-person contact and her husband passed away several years ago. So it's just her at home. And so she relies on family to come and visit her all the time. Like that's what she relies on is her son visits her I, and she's, she's 87 years old and she lives on her own. She's, she doesn't want to live with anybody. <laughs> she's very independent. Uh, was driving. She still has a car and a license and everything. But when you start to think about, how depressing it is for somebody who they're used to like, they could see their son all the time. They're going to church all the time. They're, they're being in person is, is the foundation of, of everything for her. Um, so I've been able to, to keep her in my bubble and be able to visit, but um, I don't think we're talking about like the depression enough that people are facing. And then a lot of the judgment and, and shame that's happening as well because I told somebody, oh, my grandma was so excited. She got this new um, sweater or whatever from a friend of mine. My friend sent me with a sweater from my grandma. <laughs> and um, I took a video because she was so excited about it. And she's like, I can't wear, wait to wear this to church. She's just like, oh, she's so excited. 
And one of um, one of my friends said, you know, she's like, well, she can't, she shouldn't be going to church. She's going to get sick. And so there's so much, just there's so much, uh, there's so many layers to all of this. It's this, you know, feeling depressed because you can't be around your family, and then feeling kind of guilty because maybe you are hanging out with people when you shouldn't be, or maybe you forgot your mask, or maybe you went to church when you should have probably stayed home, and then judgment on the flip side of that of should we be judging and shaming people who maybe maybe they were maybe they did go do something they weren't really supposed to do and how can we help them to to reduce their risk of exposure and talk about it in a way that is less shaming them and more trying to educate and help them figure out ways to to connect without exposing themselves to the risk of covid um, but that's that's just something i've been thinking about and i think that one of the um I always try to think of like, well, what would be a good thing that might come out of this? It's all pretty awful. But one thing is kind of forcing us to to look at the, the digital divide that exists and it's mm. forcing us to pay attention and get creative about the way we connect with people because there's entire populations and groups of people that just, they just don't know. I mean, I got on Teresa. Zoom. I love yeah, that point. Cool. That's a huge yeah. point for us too. In courts, we see a lot of folks that don't even have access to the resources that they need to appear, mm -hmm. um, or they don't know how to use them, and then they yeah. end up getting defaulted or something, you know. And then, what to your point about folks that may not just have the literacy for it, for personal connection. So there is that big divide there, but there also is, like you were saying, this sense of that things have been a bit cracked open and maybe we'll be able to heal some of these areas and clock some of these gaps because it's more visible now, these disparities. And I just want to take a moment before we pop on, we got a few of our guests back in. We yay. got, yay, yeah. Would you guys, Isaiah, we popped right in and Kenyatta, we kind of skipped over the introductions. Would you guys like to let us know kind of who you are and what your superpower is? Ah, Before we yeah, ask you guys yeah, some more yeah, questions. Kenyatta, you're first, you're first. You're first. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hey, everybody. Good to be here with you all today. Um, thank you for this awesome space. This is wonderful. So my name is Kenyatta Dotson. Um, I'm connected with many organizations, faith-based organizations, community-based organizations in the community. Um, I work at the Flint Registry and also with PPHI in the community helping families who have been impacted by the Flint water crisis, making sure they're connected to resources and services so that we can continue to build and, and just heal as a community mm. and, and, and as families. Um, I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother, and um, I mean, I love the city of Flint. I've been here all my life. And so um, y'all got me. <laughs> so thank you for um, allowing me to be here. My superpower, um, I would say patience. <laughs> Ooh. Patience is my superpower by far. <laughs> That's a huge mm. one. <laughs> Man, I don't know that I have a, a superpower and I definitely can't top that introduction by can get a dot. So um, <laughs> I'll just say one, I'm, one, I'm thankful. For, I'm thankful for the opportunity to be here. Um, looking forward to the mm. conversation. My name is Isaiah Oliver. I'm president and CEO at the Community Foundation of Greater Flint. Um, a philanthropic organization um, that operates across Genesee County focused on meeting the needs of folks in this community who are marginalized the most and helping to create a community where everyone can live and work and thrive and prosper together. Um, um, I guess with regard to COVID, we, are, we do lead the task force on racial inequities, um, focused on disparities that we see happening in black and brown populations related to um, COVID. Um, we also lead in partnership with the United Way of Genesee County, the Greater Flint Urgent Relief Fund, which was doing relief fund efforts and resources out to small um, small to medium-sized nonprofits that were impacted negatively by COVID. And so um, in both spaces, we've been actively working. We did some work to close out the end of the year with some CARES Act grant making um, through the Ra Rapid Response Initiative that went through the task force itself and through the Greater Flint Urgent Relief Fund. Um, and then my team, is in and of Genesee County. We have 22 staff members that are that live right here in Genesee County. We have 440 volunteers that help us to make grant making decisions and, and give us investment advice and give us governance. And Ken, Kenyatta Dotson is on one of those committees. Um, so uh, 
we are, I'm excited about the opportunity to be here and, and to take the deep dive into what I would say has been plaguing our community, not just with this crisis, but crisis over crisis. Quite frankly, we moved mm -hmm. from um, General Motors leaving our community and we had to wrestle with that economic issue, if you will. We, we wrestled with the water crisis. And before we could even put a book in on a water crisis, we moved to a, a global health pandemic. And then from a global health pandemic, we really start to wrestle with the economic downturn that happened as a result of that global health pandemic. And then we had a global reckoning on race that happened <laughs> while we were wrestling with all of this. And then we're watching political polarization happen. I mean, just as early as earlier this month, we really watched political polarization come to a head. And so these are all multiple crises that are hitting our country. But those folks that are marginalized the most, those folks that live in Flint and high areas with high concentrations of poverty, they are impacted mm. doubly, <laughs> bigly or doubly, whatever <laughs> you want to use. Right? But they're hit, they're, hit the oh, hardest. they're hit the hardest when these things happen. And so we have to be thoughtful about um, those about those amongst us that um, we say the weakest link. No, those folks who have been not who haven't been cared for appropriately are hurt the mm -hmm. most. Crisis. Dr. Reynolds, who many of us look to for advice during this pandemic, um, have been looked to advice or looked to for advice during this pandemic. Would always remind us. Um, when when the nation gets get a cold, black people get the flu, and so mm. we gotta make sure that we're taking care of those who need to be taken care of or supported the most. So, um, excited again about the opportunity to be here. So I uh, know we're gonna so we're gonna ride that wave, right? Um, I feel there's like there's a lot there. Yeah, there was a lot there. We I don't mean, even need these questions. Okay. Yeah. So you, you mentioned a few things, right? You mentioned um and so and Angela's from Saginaw, right? So I feel like through this conversation, we'll be able to draw some parallels between like what's going on there and what's mm -hmm. going on here. But you talked about how we've gone from trauma to trauma to trauma, and you've talked about how we've experienced political um polarization. And when you think about messaging, right? When you think about media there are messages that are sent through media and i um you know they're meant to make us feel some kind of way and so i'm curious on your thoughts on what is not being mentioned in mainstream conversations surrounding COVID, uh -huh. and because it wouldn't be me if i didn't add an end to it right um what areas need to be addressed in an effective community response to COVID at the local level state level or federal levels um and and to your point isaiah if that includes not just responding in reference to COVID, but also some of the other traumas we've experienced we'll take that too yeah. floor is open yeah i still think that the um that there's not a lot of focus on what happens to us mentally when we go through trauma after trauma after trauma after trauma. Um, and then on top of that, being asked to work from home full time. And if you have children, which if you're a parent, your, your superpower is you definitely got to be related to parenting because now I'm watching all my friends raise kids and to work from home full time after all of this really traumatic things have happened and also your kids are at home full, basically full time. And then they can't go anywhere when school is over. So it's, I don't think we're talking about that enough. What is it like to try to work on the computer and turn around and tell your eight year old to also work on a computer and sit down and do, and we have a lot of, you know, there's a lot of parents that are single parents and things like that. <clears throat> I've watched my friends struggle with it and I, and you know, we've got a lot of privilege in that they are able to handle it. Um, but it's a struggle. And so thinking about what if you don't have privileges or what if there's some, some serious things going on home uh, at home that maybe people are living in dangerous situations. Even. Mm. That struck a nerve with me, what you said, Teresa, because what bothers me the most is to see how many senior citizens over 80 or 79 on up who have died through this, particularly mm. African-Americans. And especially I think about my own church and I would say we probably lost 20 or 30 of our most respected oh. leaders in our church. And this Oof. is the oldest, the, the only African-American, I mean, African Methodist Episcopal Church in Saginaw, Bethel AME Church and we have just lost our foundation. And so I think about it from the aspect of people are grieving alone. Mm. We as people of color sometimes don't seek 
mental health services? Well, if I wanted mental health services and I'm socially isolated, how do I receive support without feeling stereotyped or stigmatized? And if I don't have technology, what do I do besides watch TV all day? I'm carrying grief. I'm carrying the loss of not only maybe one relative or friend, it may be one or five. When you read the read the newspapers, you read or hear the news and you hear about whole families being wiped out by COVID. I mean, mm -hmm. I pray hard for people and it makes me paranoid because I am a registered nurse and I take care of my 89 year old mom. I wear a mask in the house because I don't want her to catch anything from me going out. And I think about the people who don't have you know, a level of understanding about COVID. And when I see seniors in the stores wearing a mask over their mouths and not the nose, and this being airborne, that's detrimental. And so it's just so much. And I always try to figure out, okay, God, how can we push a magic button so that everybody gets a better understanding of, of this and what they can do to pr protect themselves? And so we're not that, but all of us serve in a role to help improve this. But mm -hmm. it's a struggle, it's a challenge. And so I've always been a person with the big balloon type vision to say, I gotta, I wanna reach thousands or I wanna reach at this event, I wanna reach a hundred people instead of learning how to say, if I touch the life of one person, it's what my friends always tell me and my colleagues, Angela, if you made a difference of one person, you know, pat yourself on the back. But I just want everybody to be better or their lives improved, you know? <laughs> Touch one yeah. person, that's enough. So what I hear, yeah. I've heard you all. So our question was, what isn't being addressed in mainstream conversations surrounding COVID? One. Two, and what areas need to be addressed in an effective community response to COVID at the local, state, and federal levels? So in the responses we've heard thus far, I've heard you touch on um, mental health, that people are grieving alone, um, mm. parent work balance, right? Not just work-life balance, but, but parent work balance, right? And then I also heard you touch on senior deaths. Kenyatta Isaiah, is there anywhere you wanna chime in there? What isn't being mentioned? And what needs to happen in order for us to respond appropriately? Um, you know, I'll, I think what, what isn't happening enough and, and is we're not hearing enough about what's happening. For, for pandemics and for crises and traumas, the, and the trauma that, the continual trauma that Flint has, Flint families, Flint individuals, Flint residents have faced, I don't think we hear enough on the front end. We should, this is an urgent situation and I think we should constantly be hearing updates. We should constantly be hearing what's going on, particularly as it relates to underserved, marginalized, the most vulnerable, those who are um, at the highest risk. We should constantly have this information in front of our face in front of the news, utilizing whoever, media sources, whatever means of communication to our advantage. I feel like a lot of times information comes last and and, and the people are left to discover uh, what's going on kind of uh, like at the 11th hour. And unfortunately that's something that we need to work on because I think it happened with the water crisis. I think is is happening to a certain extent with the pandemic i think we're doing a better job with the pandemic in terms of having better systems in place but when people's lives are at stake we need information quick and we need it on the front on the forefront and we need to utilize people as partners to the best of our ability yeah. and i also believe yeah. one um you know i keep hearing things in the community about the nursing homes, that, that that there's a concern as it relates to the nursing homes. And again, this is another vulnerable population. Um, and so I think just having that information about communication and having, having it at the forefront, if we were 
made aware about how things are going in the nursing home with at-risk communities, um, with at-risk um, community-based organizations and centers and things like that, I think we would know how things are going across the board with at nursing homes and, and things of that nature. We would, for, for, for the most part, we would have an idea that things are going okay or if there's some concern that we need to um, be aware of. I agree with that. And there's also a gap with, you know, civic engagement and, and how difficult that is right now, because you have yeah. to, again, you have to either have a computer or have a phone and have, you know, and, and you've, you've probably been to our city council meetings. You have to have a spare four or five hours and a computer or a phone or whatever. And it's already, you know, people were already likely to try to avoid going, and doing civic engagement before before COVID. Um, so it's just, it's just more barriers that we have to try to remove for people. You know, um, with COVID and us being a community health center, what we had to start doing is figuring out how are we gonna communicate with the people that we normally would communicate with in the populations, in the neighborhoods that are considered limited access to services. And so we figured out that once once the school districts uh, announced that they were providing food giveaways to the kids, we started partnering with them to get flyers out about COVID. And every single entity that has been providing that service in Saginaw, um, we have utilized their services and uh, print out thousands of flyers so that they go out with those boxes or food giveaways or those lunch bags just to let people know that our services are available. But the initial action was to educate them on COVID and try to put it in plain language because we got to still think about health literacy. And so some people say you got the virus, you didn't heard the China virus. You, Corona. Some people don't know the difference between coronavirus and COVID to un COVID-19 understanding it's the same thing. And so mm -hmm. trying to put the message out through that type of resource. And we have really relied on our local um, radio stations, especially for the brown and black communities to try to help us host events like this so yeah. that people become more educated. And they do have to see people who look like them. Mm -hmm. uh, in order yeah. to garner that trust, yeah. which is most the ultimate uh, priority right now with COVID vaccine is that they have to see people who they trust to receive that message in a way that's going to convince me to say I'm willing to take the vaccine. So it sounds like, so what I hear is when we talk about what would need to happen in response, I hear vacation, I hear communication systems. And I see that Isaiah has some thoughts that he has to add on to that as well. Yeah, I think I think communication is extremely important. Um, I think as you ask the question, what isn't happening or what isn't being shared or shared enough in the mainstream? I think one is that there's a backlog. So what I often hear is about anti-vaxxers or what I often hear is about all of these black people who have issues with whether or not they're going to take the vaccine. And then we go down the conversations about the Tuskegee experiments and all. like mm. a lot of that. I think there's some myth busting and I would depend on our MDs in our community, our epidemiologists in our community to break that down. But there's a mm -hmm. lot of myth busting that needs to happen. Quite frankly, there are 30,000 people that are on waiting lists in Genesee County waiting to get the vaccine. And many of those people are people of color. They can't get it. And so when we keep saying, when we keep sending the message that black people aren't taking this vaccine and then you see CNN and ABC World Report and all these folks are saying that black people won't get the vaccine. Now you're perpetuating that thing in community. And people are thinking about it. Well, the reality is we're just slightly under, and I'll get the numbers. The CDC has produced these numbers, right? We're just slightly under the, the, the white population on taking the vaccine. So it ain't like if, if a group is questioning it, a group is questioning it. I think, um, so that's one thing. I think there is some myth busting that needs to happen. Um, I also think that when we start talking about, you also see this happening in the news and it's happening all too much, but maybe it's not the things that don't need to happen, but maybe some of the things that shouldn't. Well, um, what I've seen in the news all too often is that um, we're going to tie the water crisis and the experience of black people that live in Flint with their, their, their not trusting systems, right? But then we tie it to the vaccine. No, 
we reserve the right in Flint to question everything and everybody. It's, it, this, has, this is not just about the vaccine. This isn't just about COVID. Flint people will ask a question about anything because we don't, we have, the, per, the people responsible for supporting us, for taking care of us, for making sure we were protected was the federal government, then the state government, then the local government, and they all failed us at some level. So mm -hmm. it's not about the vaccine. We don't trust systems. So when people come to do a report on Flint, tell them that we're resilient. And the reason why we are is because we reserve the right to question everything, but don't tie us to a vaccine because that's what they're doing. Mm. Nationally, they're tying this idea of Flint people, a majority black city. They're all anti-vaxxers. No, we not. We just want you to tell us all the information so we can make the best decision for us and our families. And that's only fair. I think there's also, um, I'm probably getting a little hype. I'm sorry. Um, I think that's there's great. another reason. I think we need to delineate between shared responsibility and personal responsibility. And we can't keep doing the victim shaming, right? If I'm wearing my mask and I'm appropriately social distancing, and if it gets really crowded in a space, then I'm not going to be there for too long. I'm doing my part. But vaccines and then vaccine logistics and availability, that's not my part. That's shared responsibility. That's community responsibility. When you start talking about mm -hmm. contact tracing, that's not my part. When you start access to testing, that's not my part. Even ventilation in buildings, that's not my part. So let's talk about what I'm going to do, what I'm going to bring to the table for me and my family, and then what I'm depending on systems to do on behalf of me and my family. And now we can start have a, having a conversation about accountability when it comes to a public health pandemic. And we're not having the appropriate conversation because many times we say, well, this is what this group should be doing. And then we start overlapping it. Well, you need to appropriately social distance. But I work at Kroger. And I bag. I can't appropriately social distance and feed my family. So let's talk talk about what the system needs to do to support me in that space and how I need access to PPP and how the organization. I mean, so I think there are layers to this that aren't um, excavated appropriately. Mm. And I think we stay surface level and then we start doing victim shaming. And I don't and I don't think our communities appreciate that. I'm, I'm going to yes. stop. So we should go on mute right now. Isaiah's talking no, to Isaiah, you. you just said that's uh, so much of what you said. I want to ask so many questions about it. You hit so many great points. Um, but I wanted to circle back to kind of what you talked about actually the first time you answered a question. And you mentioned you and I had talked a few times on different panels about our our government's history of government sanctioned racism and segregation and the fair housing issues that we see in our fair housing you center. Sure you and want to have this conversation? I'm gonna my book. Let's go. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So I wanted to ask you, so I know you just answered a question, but you brought up this point that we, I'm curious how you see our history with that. I mean, you brought up um, the sit down strikes, you brought up Flint is the first city in the nation to have a fair housing act pa law passed at the local level. Um, and that was born largely out of the segregated GM housing. So all of these things are very tied together. Um, like you said, it's very layered, it's very nuanced. And I feel like the conversations don't dip past that surface level often. So I want to, I really want to capitalize on what you've raised here is so important. How do you see, how do you see that? I guess let me phrase this differently. How do you see that history impacting this response, this COVID response now? And also, especially in the area of vaccines, how do you so, see that all tying together? Ah, so that's interesting. I got to tie it to vaccines, but I can't just talk about the sit down strike in Flint or the history of the mm -hmm. development of Flint or General Motors, right? We've got to go back 400 years. This can, this, this system that we all operate in is a system that perpetuates inequities and those inequities show up in disparities or differences in the numbers. So black people don't have access here. And so they're like, why are more black people from the north side of Flint? Maybe potentially, let me not say that. Why are more black people dying as a result of COVID? Why, more, why are more black people at, um, impacted by COVID? Well, because black people are disproportionately impacted by poverty. And why are black people disproportionately impacted by poverty? Because the systems that we operate in perpetuate disparities in the numbers that don't allow access for black people to capital, to the economy. To I mean, like all of these systems are operating against a group of people because of the color of their skin. And so when, it doesn't matter what the crisis is. Again, when the country gets a cold, black people get the flu because of years of exploitation of black bodies or exploitation or dehumanizing of black people. Right. And so that just plays out when a crisis hits our community, when a crisis hits our community. Those folks, MLK would say those people that we've thingified. Right. Mm -hmm. we made, like and I know you probably have heard MLK talk about thingification. Right. It's, mm -hmm. it's dehumanizing a person because of their skin color. But that's generational and it passes from generation to generation. So, right. What do we do? We start justifying why we thingify certain groups. 
And then we start creating policies that, that, that further support the justification of thinkifying groups. And then we ask questions like why at the height of this crisis did 85% of the, why were 85% of the cases black people? And mm -hmm. why were 90% of the deaths black people? Because they are marginalized by se separation, right? Colonization. We start talking about housing and access to healthy foods and access to mm -hmm. quality education. The people who don't have access to those things are also the folks that are disproportionately impacted by a public health crisis. And so, yes, it's important to think about the systems that perpetuating inequities, which is the reason why when we started when this first hit and we started talking about our response to COVID, we didn't only talk about the health community in the health community is extremely important. Mm -hmm. But we start talking about all of the other systems that intersect with the health community. What is the faith community doing in response to COVID? How are they galvanizing and collecting credible messengers? You start talking about the, the faith community, who do we listen to when things get tough? When things get difficult and we turn to wonder and we have to unpack that, who do we call? Our pastor? How are we engaging those credible messengers in the conversation? When we start having issues across our country, we start having issues in our country in the 60s and 70s, who are we engaging? MLK was a black pastor, mm -hmm. right? We start, those are the leaders that stepped up, up for us over and over again, our faith leaders. So how are we engaging them in the conversation? How are we engaging the business banking and workforce development community in this conversation? Is it health related? No, we're talking about reopening restaurants. Mm -hmm. We're talking about people operating in grocery stores and small businesses. We're talking about millions and trillions of dollars coming in to so support small businesses landing on their feet. But how is that intersecting with the health of people? How are we engaging the philanthropic community? Before we ever got a state or federal allocation to support with COVID, the philanthropic community was trying to respond by supporting the nonprofit community. How are we engaging them with equitable redistribution or distribution of assets or resources? How, how are we engaging the government committee for fair and fair application of the law when we start thinking about how we, have, when you tell somebody they can open 25% on February 1st, 25% of the restaurant can be, how are we ensuring fair, fair <laughs> application of that law? How are we sure that black businesses aren't being held to a different standard than, black, than white businesses in that conversation? And we gotta have all of those folks at the table having those conversations at the same time gr grounded in facts grounded in the scientific facts around what COVID is doing to our communities. So it's a multi-sector approach to a multi-sector problem. And those sectors are often regulated by policies that aren't always supportive of people of color, those folks that are marginalized the most, especially when it comes to public health pandemics. I'm sorry, well, I talked too long. Well, that was a good Isaiah show. Let's see. <laughs> No, that, that was incredible. Seriously. Isaiah, there were so many things that you were saying. I don't even know where to go next. Yeah. I know Katie, I know Katie and Ash, you need to, to moderate and, and host the host, you know, do the host thing. But you were just saying so many things. You were like, I'm getting hyped up and I'm over here like, yes, just all the just yes, all the things that you said. Like people are asking why. Why are more black people been, being affected? Why are more poor people being affected? Why? It's like, because we built the system that way, like, because it's on purpose. Like, why are we in the situation we're in? Because we have racist policies and racist systems that were designed to do exactly what they're doing, which is keeping people who don't, keeping people in power, in power. That's exactly what the systems, they're broken systems for, for the people who are been, you know, disenfranchised by them. But people are saying, well, why is it that this is happening to black people? Why is this that it's happening to poor, you know, poor white people in our communities, too? That it's because it was built that way. We did like this. The society built it that way. It's it's mm -hmm. not even broken. It's working. That is the way that people wanted it to work. They wanted it to work so that the people in power stay in power. And so I, I was just over here like, oh, my God. All yes, exactly. <laughs> we can't really address so many of these things until we address a larger systems issue and why do why do black people in flint not trust the vac do we don't trust the vaccine so just so called i i don't even believe that that's actually the situation um you know is it that or is it just that we don't trust we don't trust the government period we, about we don't trust people in general because what we did people put they put highways through our communities they gave us water that didn't that wasn't right they like they're so they pulled up there's so many things you have to go back and back and back and back to find the system has all it's been this way for a long time and 
once COVID came and schools got shut down, you know, kids couldn't go into school. The first thing people started asking, well, how are kids going to get their food? It's like, we should have been asking that a long time ago. Why are we question? Why is that the main way for children to be fed? We're like, oh, well, what are people going to do? How are they going to get all the resources they need? Why do they get, why is that what we are relying on? That's not, that doesn't work. It hasn't worked for the people who have had to rely on that. So I just, I really appreciate that because it's, it's a very broken situation for a lot of people. And to think, you know, yeah, we, we're all on a waiting list for COVID. So when people say, well, black people don't trust co the vaccine, I'm like, nobody can get the vaccine. I'm on the waiting list. You're on the waiting list. We're all on the waiting list. What are you talking <laughs> about? Um, but one thing I think that we, we have, we don't really, uh, that we don't talk about, uh, is the way that we reach out to people. As I know, you know, I know that our faith leaders are really play a really important role in the black community and their, um, especially in this community in Flint. But then we don't talk about like the black community that's not connected with the church. Like then what? Like if you, everybody, oh, go, we're connecting with the black community. We're going to the faith leaders. Like, well, that's not synonymous with the black. Like it is a very important role in our community here and probably in a lot of black communities. But what what's that gap? How are we? What do we do if we don't go to church? Like, how do they, how do we address that? But I just, I appreciate everything that you said. I know you were like, oh, I'm talking a lot. But I, I thought that everything you said was just so valid. So I really mm. appreciate that. And it was so well said. Was and what I kind of hear is the question was kind of a setup, right? Because we asked you about how our country's um, history is impacting perceptions. And then we asked how that relates to the vaccine. But really what I'm hearing is, um, one, we have the right to question. Two, if you look at the numbers, it's, it's not necessarily that brown folks are, you know, questioning too much more than, than any other culture or if you will, or, or race, if that's a thing, right? Um, and so three, just being thoughtful here is that it, it might not necessarily just be our history um, that's causing us to question and we shouldn't make assumptions that way. Is that kind of what I'm hearing? The question was, was a little bit of a setup noted and pinned. So I also heard you mentioning um, different entities, if you will, uh, and how it is that we are reaching out to them, how it is that we are addressing them. I heard you mention the faith-based faith -based community. I heard you mention health institutions. I heard you mention um, business and banking and workforce. I heard you mention the philanthropic community. I heard you mention the nonprofit community, but I would be remiss if Katie and I weren't sitting here in our roles with Legal Services of Eastern Michigan, and we didn't ask you specifically how you thought that legal aid agencies or entities like ours, how we should be engaged in being of support. How can we have best be support? So let me just share with Saginaw. We started a partnership with Legal Aid Services maybe three years ago. And it's our vision to actually provide legal services within our community health centers. But of course, COVID came and we were on our second application of submitting for to the Community Foundation for a grant. But at the same time, uh, your representatives have been at the table for our community meetings that we hold internally at Great Lakes, as well as sharing other partnerships that they can they can become more involved with. Uh, right now, we have a strong faith-based leaders. African American uh, Saginaw African American pastors have formed a group uh, in the community to focus on uh, bringing these topics to um, the community, whether they are a member of the church or not. But at the same time, when we talk about there are so many people who are not affiliated with churches, but taking the information out to the community. And so I have to say that we've been fortunate enough to work with some of the area churches and try to figure out those same pockets I mentioned earlier. Like there's a grocery store across the street from a church. And so we started taking our flyers there to the store and we hosted a COVID testing pop-up site at the church across the street due to logistics. 
but trying to reach the masses where they are instead of expecting them to come on the church grounds or expecting them to come to a school or the other side of town. We can't do that. We just got to go in the neighborhoods and try to do the best we can in terms of providing those kind of services to people. I would, um, I would echo. I would echo what Angela has said. I think uh, legal services does a phenomenal job in the community, particularly as it relates to responding to residents and to um, persons who call in for help and for assistance. Every time I've called in for a question or trying to help someone in community um, with a legal issue, you know, legal services doesn't always answer the phone, but they always call back. And it doesn't take a week, five days, seven days, uh, three days. Usually they call back within a 24 to 48 hour time period. That is really good. Um, one thing I would say is for legal services, the peace that you all have is, is, so, is so needed in community. I always hear people um, talk about the problems that they have. And I know the legal services could definitely be an ally um, with a number of faith-based faith -based organizations, community-based organizations, and then just neighborhood champions um, that are doing really good work in the community. Mm -hmm. So to maybe establish a larger network, um, to collaborate a little bit more or quite a bit more with partners um, deep in the community, um, who are doing good work and who have large networks in and of themselves, I think that will really help to extend the reach of our legal services of Eastern Michigan right here in the city of Flint and to maybe reach more and be able to do even more than what you're already doing. So one of my commitments is for Saginaw County is to reach out to legal services and introduce them to some of the newly um, uh, newly formed community partnerships due to COVID so that they become more engaged. We lost our communication in March because we did have representatives, of our, as I said, come to meetings. But now that we have established different partnerships for the sake of making sure that we are meeting the needs of the marginalized populations and those who don't have a voice. And I think that there's an opportunity for uh, legal legal services to become more actively engaged as a partner with not just faith-based, but the next phase of my thought process in leading the coordination of COVID um, for our organization is to engage with our Panhellenic uh, groups in Saginaw, since everybody is at home and utilizing them to help us in terms of our, our staffing capacity within our organization is very limited because our staff is doing COVID testing, they're doing flu vaccines, and now here is COVID vaccine and everybody hats off because they're doing an awesome job. But I'm looking at it now as how can we bring in people who really want to be a part of doing something that can help with relieving some of the burden, but at the same time being that familiar face in the community to help with the students and tutoring possibly virtually, uh, and then helping us with the vaccine. Because I agree with Isaiah, we got people that look like us are just waiting to get their turn to get a vaccine. Being a healthcare provider, I received my vaccine four weeks ago, so it's time for my second one. And so just being able to share that experience with other people who were curious, and I volunteered as uh, one of the only, uh, one as an African-American leader in my organization, I wanted to be one of the first ones because I, I wanted to experience that so that I could share my experience with other people in the community to say it's okay. I had no side effects. I had a sore arm, everything that they said to expect. You know, I was fortunate I didn't have any type of severe reaction or anything. I just had a sore arm and kind of felt tired the day after. But two days later, nobody could even tell me that I had received the COVID vaccine. It was that easy and no problems. And so I am so pleased as a nurse to hear about so many of us who are just waiting. And so we have been trying to put measures in place to... Um, 
try to help people register because again the technology and I, I saw I think in, in was it in your county that you started a registry where people can go online or something to register for the vaccine so we've had yeah, that. Right. Oh, the vaccine, or I just thought you meant the Flint registry in general. So I take that back. I'm not informed enough to know if that's okay. a thing. <laughs> so in Saginaw County, the health department has an online, they have a website that you can register anybody 65 and older. So fortunately, that that service goes directly to the Commission on Aging in Saginaw. So they are the ones who are coordinating the appointments and scheduling for people to go and get the vaccine. So what was so pleasing to me is over the weekend, about eight people texted me or called me and said, I got a vaccine on Friday or I'm scheduled to get one on Tuesday. And so we're not being lost out, but we just are encouraging people, hey, you got to register. If you're 65 and older, you got to put your name on that registry. And you will get a call. Don't think that it's an unknown person or a scam call. If they call you, answer your phone. Let's get you there. I've heard things where people are saying, oh, I'm not ready to take the vaccine. I want to wait until Johnson & Johnson's vaccine comes out because it's only one dose. Do not wait. Please don't wait. We need to get the vaccine as quickly as possible. You see what's happening in the government? There's a limited amount of vaccine available, so we, we just can't miss that opportunity. So we have to do whatever we can in terms of actively taking measures to ensure that the people who look like me are driven there wherever the location to get the shot, okay? I read something before this as I was, um, I was in my perfectionism of studying all your questions, Ashley and uh, Katie, and this was real profound to me. It says, it is, this is a document that says building trust and access to COVID-19 COVID vaccine among people of color and tribal nations. So it says it is critical to note that vaccines don't prevent disease and save lives. Getting people vaccinated prevents disease and saves lives. So I thought that was very profound to share. It is. And you also made me realize we're going to stop sending out questions because we're going to stop sending out our questions so y'all can stop studying. Yes, Isaiah, you muted. You're still on mute. I said the most profound stuff while I was on mute, just so you all know. <laughs> um, I don't even know that I can follow up what I just said. No, no, honestly, Ms. Williams, I just kudos to you because I did not um, do a good job of reading through the questions prior to. And so I'm flying off of the cuff here. But at least, you know, you're getting it. You're getting it straight up. So um, to answer your question about what legal agencies are, legal, is that the same questions? It, yeah. What you can do to support. Um, I was sitting here thinking like we're still I'm still in the month of celebrating the king. I'm going to keep doing this. Right. I'm still celebrating MLK. So if you hear more MLK quotes throughout this, just know that I'm still celebrating the king and the king that we don't talk about. Not the king that we all celebrate, but the king that we don't talk about, the king that went in one of his latter speeches. Um, where do we go from here? If you haven't read it or listened to it, please do. He says that the, the issues of race and war and poverty are all intertwined. And when he starts mm -hmm. to unpack poverty, he starts talking about exploiting poverty and how it's an economic driver to exploit poverty. And so if I were to be if I was responding to you on what you all can do, you all are there to ensure fair, fair application of the policies, fair application of the law. And what we know is happening in this moment beyond just people needing access to testing or access to a vaccine or other areas in that, I mean, mask or PPP or PPE, all of that stuff. Beyond that, regular life is happening. I can't go to work and I might lose my job. And the state of Michigan created a, a, a housing diversion program, right? How do we make sure that people aren't being taken advantage of or exploited by folks, right? How do we ensure... We're sharing appropriate information broadly. So is there a list of frequently asked questions that people are wrestling with because they're poor and they don't have access to appropriate legal counsel? Is there, are there 10 questions that if you all jumped on live and answered those 10 questions for people across this community, that they'll be able to navigate already existing policies or executive orders that are there to protect them, that they don't understand, that they don't know because they don't have access to someone interpreting that information for them? 
You all are the legal experts, but you're willing to give that information to folks and protect folks that are living in poverty from being exploited. I think the opportunity has presented itself over and over again for those experts to lend their to lend that expertise to folks who need it the most. The health community is doing it. We've got medical doctors and epidemiologists and scientists from all from all over the place that are lending their expertise and credibility to make sure we understand what's happening with COVID and the vaccine and the rollout. How do we get our legal community to really step up and say, hey, listen, we understand that people are being exploited during this time that they're on their last. How do we provide them supports, right? What are the 15 frequently asked questions that a person that's renting right now that could be exploited by a person that they're renting from could benefit from that you all could offer? I think those are things that we got to lean in. It's, I mean, in my faith tradition, we say the overflow isn't for you. So when you start getting enough or making enough that you're taking care of, how do you start giving away these services to support the people who need it the most? And so I think there are plenty of opportunities for you to partner with giving your or lending your expertise, your time and talent to making sure folks who need it the most are protected from being exploited during a time where, man, the, the issues are piling on top of one another. Yeah, and no, I can say, you know, even as an attorney, there are things that I have to read a few times. And I just think so often that if I was someone, a lay person, even just, you know, even someone who had higher education, these these systems are not easy to navigate. I think they're built in a way that makes them difficult to navigate. And just even if you look at Genesee County, for instance, has the highest level of evictions in the state. If you look at also the disparity in how many people are represented, I think you could take a good guess at how many landlords have attorneys and how many tenants do. And it's very, it's a very, very wide gap there. Um, so for us, I think I just wanted to touch on that, Isaiah, because it is so important. And I don't want people to feel um, like they can't ask for help in those spaces that we're here and we're available to them. And there are, there are parts of this system that are difficult even for us to navigate as attorneys. And I think like you said, when there's trauma kind of baked on top of trauma, sometimes it makes it even more difficult to navigate when maybe a trauma response is avoidance and we don't hear from this client until you know the, the hearing has passed and they're just so stressed and overwhelmed with everything else that other other aspects of their life, whether it's systemic poverty or issues of even just this past year, that I think a lot of folks can relate to um, this grief, this grieving of the way things were and the way that they aren't anymore. This permission I mean, to say, you know, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say from a health perspective, there was a time I remember when we had our rotary phone on the wall and I would have a fever and my mom would go on and she would call, ask a nurse and you would ask, ask a nurse a question and they would give you the answer. So you didn't have to go to the hospital, quite frankly, because we didn't have a car. So going to the hospital wasn't that easy for us. Right. But we had ask a nurse and my mom could figure it out for me at home. What if we could have an ask a Katie? I mean, and it was just related to just related to COVID, but people could call in or they could sign in on Facebook Live and they could pepper you with questions and anyone you couldn't answer. I'll get back to you. But I'm behind on my rent. Now, it's COVID related because I lost my job, but reality is right in front of my face, I'm behind on my rent. I'm not thinking mm -hmm. about a vaccine. I'm not thinking about testing. I'm not thinking about about the 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 um, the Tuskegee experiment or modern gynecology mm -hmm. and people being exploited or medical. I'm not thinking about any of that. I'm trying to figure out how to navigate being behind on my rent. And if Katie can offer me some assistance on the eviction um, the diversion program that the state has offered and give me some comfort, that might that mental comfort might allow me some time to sit back and say, OK, now I need to get on the list at Meyer and I need to get on the list at the county health department because now I've taken that off of my shoulders and I can think about those other things that are in front of me. I think that type of real I heard Teresa talking about this when I first jumped on those mental stresses. I mean, I can't even see clear because I can't eat. Right. Who's going to help me navigate get to the food bank of eastern Michigan and get in line and get in a box? Right. Got that taken care of. Now I've got some rental diver diversion issues. OK, now Katie helped me get that taken care of. Now I can deal with the vaccine. Now I can deal with eating healthy and maybe getting some vitamins in my body. Right. But before that, my immediate needs have to be met. And if I can't mm -hmm. ensure cover for my family, then all of that other stuff. Me, hit, me, hit me with that stuff when I take care of this immediate stuff. Maslow's, I'm not going to go into the Maslow's hierarchy of human needs, but that is what we're talking about. How do we make sure we're managing the basic needs of people in our community so they can be thoughtful about weighing whether or not I'm afraid of COVID or if I'm afraid, which one am I afraid of more, COVID or vaccine? Like that's the mm -hmm. question, but I can't get to that question if I'm worried about the roof over my head and my kids eating. 
Yeah, and you mentioned your, because uh, you, you talked about that and it just made me think like, you know, I can't pay my rent. I'm worried about COVID. Add on this extra layer of also I've got two or three kids and they all have different classrooms they need to be in and they all have to have a special space to do that in. Why are you in my house right now? Exactly. <laughs> Okay. I mean, I've got friends that have kids that are seven and eight and they, you know, where are they going to go to school? Okay. Set up your school area on the dining room table while I'm on zoom, but you're on third grade and your sister's on second grade and your brother's on seventh grade. But we like, and also I'm behind on my rent and also I need to order groceries. Oh, but you should use Instacart. Well, I can't afford that. So now what do I do? Oh, my car broke down. We need to get on the bus. Well, you can't really social distance on the bus. So so there's so many layers of trauma that people are dealing with. And at the end of the day, people are just like, oh, forget it. Like, it's just so stressful. And and I I mean, it's, it's just so stressful. And like you said, Katie, people are so stressed out. And it doesn't matter if you, you know, the level of stress that you have kind of changes and adjusts based on how much privilege you have. But I have friends that are, they have, you know, gr they have graduate degrees, they have full-time jobs, they have really good jobs. They got two kids crammed in the house together. They just moved into this place. This thing isn't working. That thing's not working. Their boss needs a blah, blah, blah. And COVID's here and this other. So, and then you just take away different levels of privilege and that stress just goes higher and higher. And I don't think people were talking about it enough. Like the suicide rates are high right now. It's, you know, there's... I know there's people that they they eight months in eight eight or seven or eight months in they said if I die I die that's messed up <laughs> so I don't know we're not talking about that stuff enough I don't think personally but that's just me I just so, want to add if I don't mind if you don't mind if I can add something I would like to see in Saginaw is it has to be more visibility of your organization because I think a lot of people still don't know that your services exist and i've been our organization has been a been a good effort made a good effort to try to make sure that people know since we you know we are the community health center that serves those uninsured and under underserved but at the same time it's again understanding how to navigate the system health care that's a barrier for navigating the system and the same for this and so how can you become more innovative in this world of COVID where everything is more virtual in order to meet the needs of the people who really need your services? And I'm not sure if Genesee County uses uh, 211 services. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I was looking at the numbers for uh, December for our report and the unmet, the top two unmet needs for people in Saginaw County for December were individual, family, and community support and housing. And the mm -hmm. top two say that one more time, Angela. Number one, individual, family, and community support. And number two, housing. And and in reference to the number of re the rating, the rating of referrals. Number one, utility, assistance, housing, and health care. And I would like to take just this, that's such a great point that you raised before we kind of wrap this up. I want to let our folks know, people that are watching, that the resources this time around eviction diversion are set to be distributed hopefully mid-February. Um, it requires an act of appropriations for that to happen, even though the money's already been allocated. And part of this new eviction diversion monies that will come out this round is utility support. So we're hopeful that folks that need that kind of cross support across utilities and housing can get some of those needs met a little better this time than maybe the last round of EDP. And Ashley? I got you. And so I think what resonates, um, what really resonates most with me about the conversation that we had today is we set out to have this conversation about the disproportionate impact of COVID. And we wound up having a conversation really about the disproportionate impact of poverty and really um, was what, what it makes me think is that maybe there's not so much difference. As Isaiah said, as um, Dr. Reynolds would say, when the rest of the world gets the cold, the black community gets the flu, right? As he mentioned a few times. And so it made me think that, ah, 
maybe some of these disproportionate things that we're seeing is not actually unique to COVID. You've talked about um, mental health. You've talked about parenting and work balance. You've talked about um, just feelings of isolation. You've talked about the needs of the, the senior citizens and different individuals. You've talked about the digital divide, right? Um, you've talked about who needs to be or some of the organizations or entities that need to be um, working together on these matters. And we weren't really able to dive into what that looks like. Um, but I think that's where the work lies, right? We can talk about it on this big picture level, but, but what does it look like to break it down into tangible, executable tasks? And the unique thing about each and every one of you here today is that you're doing that independently in your own lanes. And I did do a little research so I could I could go on and talk about some of the dope things that each of you are doing, but but I won't, not today. I'll just silently in the background when we get off of here, be your champions. Um, and so that being said, it's not lost on us that you took time out of your busy evenings to join us here today. Um, and it the irony, right, that you joined us on this digital live stream. I don't know if we talked about it, but digital fatigue is also a thing. And yet you still came today. You brought us your energy. You brought us your passions. You brought us your insights. And we thank you for that. Um, to all of our viewers, we thank you for joining us today. Please feel free to continue to share this conversation. Um, the feedback that you've given us is so necessary. We take it to heart. We'll take it to consideration and we'll do our best to make sure that we implement it. And please feel free to continue to share your feedback and insight with us. Thank you to each and, and every one of you who took your time to join mm -hmm. us today, whether or not you are a panelist or you are a viewer or participant. You are the problem, the best kind of problem. Go get into some good trouble. <laughs> and we'll see you next time. I see you all next time. Of Eastern Michigan Thank you. Legal Lounge. Thanks, Thanks so much. Take us out of here.